Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm super excited to be showing you a preview of the Old King's Crown. So I do want to note this is a prototype. This game is still in development. It looks very, very close to done, and it is very close to done. But uh, because there are things that can change between crowdfunding and the final product, uh, I am just giving a very quick overview. But I really like this game, so I'm hoping to come back and do a fuller tutorial when the game is complete and published officially. But for now, I wanna give you an overview of The Old King's Crown and kind of tell you what I think is special about it. Uh, I do not do paid previews. I just take preview copies of things I think are interesting. And I think this game is interesting. So this is a setup for Solo, but I'm gonna talk basically about the game and then about what makes Solo work so well. So thematically, The Old King's Crown is about trying to become the heir to the crown of a king who has died, and you are competing with other factions to take over the kingdom from this point. In order to do that, you're gonna need to make it to 20 influence before everybody else and hold on. And the way you're gonna get influence basically involves capitalizing on these different locations in the world, on getting really helpful cards from the Great Road, and on getting cards of yours into the court and using your seat of power, so in my case, the printing press, because I'm playing the red faction, to get some extra cards into my deck. So essentially, this is my opening hand. This is actually a pretty good opening hand. Uh, I drew some high cards for this game that I was planning to play. But that also means that all the low value cards are still hanging out in my deck. So oops. So you're always going to start out the game with your heir, who is worth 10, and who will typically come back to your hand for the most part. Uh, and you'll start with a ruse. So the ruse also comes back to your hand and isn't worth anything, but you can put this card down at various sites to trick people into thinking that maybe you're going for some sort of big play. And then you have these other cards that are of various values and that have different keywords on them that are gonna allow you to do different things in the game. So you're gonna have your cards and you're also gonna have access to tactics. So along the bottom of my board, I have tactics. These are unique to me. The game is asymmetrical, so each faction is gonna have access to different tactics and also to different special cards at their seats of power that can come into their hand. So tactics are gonna give you things that you're able to do, timing when you're able to do them. This game is broken down to seasons. We're gonna do a quick tour of the seasons. And when you use them, you have to pop them out, flip them over, and often you have to pay a price to reactivate the tactics so you can use it again. So you can't just use your tactics indiscriminately. You want to use them at the right time so you're getting the most bang for your buck. So I'm going to talk you through a round sequence just to give you a sense of how the game works. And then we're going to talk about solo. The game's always going to start out in the springtime. During the spring, what you're going to do is you're going to play any spring actions that you have. You're also going to place out your heralds. So each of us has... Each faction is going to have this larger piece that is a herald, and you're going to place your herald on a site that you want to try to win at during the upcoming year. And this can be a place that you seriously want to win. You do get extra influence for succeeding where your herald is placed, or it can be a bluff and you're just trying to be a pain to other people. But be careful because you can lose influence to your herald as well. So let's say that I want to just get a bunch of influence in the raw. I can come here to the harvest field and be like, yeah, I'm going to take that then other players know I want this and they can decide, well, maybe I'll go for something else or they can decide that they're going to come in and have a direct conflict with me over the spot that I said I wanted. Once everybody's done all of their spring stuff, then it's time to actually play these sweet, sweet cards. So basically the way that's going to work is players are going to take their cards and they're going to play them face down at various locations. So let's say that I was serious. My Herald's here. I really, really want this spot. I might choose to put one of my higher value cards here to try to guarantee that I get it. Then I need to place other cards at each of these locations and I might just go for it and try to win a bunch. Or maybe I'll play some lower value cards or even my ruse just to kind of get some cards out there and see what happens. So you must place a card at each of the regions of this land. But then you also have the option of placing a card next to the Great Road. And so basically this is a bidding war where the highest card value is going to get you the first crack at this market of interesting cards that help you out in the game. However, these also lock down the card that you use to bid for them. So you have to be really careful about how badly you want a card in the Great Road, because if you really want that card, you're also going to have to be willing to give up something that's in your deck to keep it. And if you use a card that's too low, somebody could actually steal it from you. So yikes. But essentially, you're going to place your cards face down at various locations to try to either win areas or trick people into thinking that you want to. 
Once all players have done this, the summer's over and you're going to move into autumn where you resolve the clashes between the cards that are at these sites. So at that point, what's going to happen is everyone's going to reveal their cards and you're going to see who wins the clash. So often that's just going to be the highest number, but that's not always the case. Some of these cards have special abilities that allow them to affect cards with certain symbols on them, uh, to eliminate cards from the game, or to bolster cards that are in neighboring regions. So really... Even a weak card can sometimes prove itself to be quite strong. So you'll have to resolve your clashes one by one, and typically the last player gets to decide which order to resolve the regions in. Once you determine who's won each region, then you get to claim rewards. So even though I won here in the harvest field, I could decide to claim the battlefield instead if I won in this region. And there are basically three regions where the winner of that region will get to choose between two rewards. And each of them is very meaningful. So for example, the castle lets you put something into the court which means that a card that's hanging out there and has a lot of authority on it is going to get you a lot of influence if you make it to the spring. The Wilderness is going to let you move a card with Quest to your side of power. So basically you can move a card up here and try to claim new cards for your deck. The Harvest Field is just raw influence and really that's never bad. Battlefield lets you take from others or claim this Collaborator token and it gives you access to a special action on your board for a limited period of time. The Shrine lets you gain some influence but also to cycle your deck a little bit. And then the Necropolis also gives you influence, but lets you get some cards from your discard pile into your hand. And that may be something that you want to do because as you go through your cards and then through your deck, once your deck runs out and you have to reshuffle, you also have a decreased hand size. So right now I'm starting with a hand size of six, but it's gonna go down as I keep cycling through my deck. So I might wanna do something like go to the Necropolis in order to reclaim some of my cards before I get too weak on the card draw. And then in the winter, you're gonna resolve the Great Road, so people who wanted some of these fancy bonus cards will get a chance to fight for those. In addition to that, again, there are tactics. You also have these companies that you can choose to place out on the board to shift things in your favor. So for example, if I really, really wanted to win in this region, then I would need to make sure that my companies also made it out here. However, they're hard to get back, so you have to really think about it when you play them, and you only have a limited number. And essentially, you just keep fighting over these different regions, claiming their rewards, and trying to keep other people from getting too powerful until you hit 20 influence. Or you'll lose and somebody else will get it first. But that takes us to talking about the solo mode of this game, which is really special in my opinion. So the thing that makes solo very special in this game is you might ask, well, how do you do a solo trick-taking bluffing game where you're fighting over different areas and you're trying to stymie the other player? Like, how can an automated player actually do that? Well, thanks to some consultation from Ricky Royal, it turns out that that is entirely possible in the case of the old King's Crown, and I'm just floored by it, to be honest with you. So essentially what will happen when you're playing solo is you're going to just take one of the other factions that you're not playing against, and they are going to be taken over, essentially, by the Simulacrum. So they're essentially a zombie faction that you're going against, taken over by the Simulacrum or the Sim. And the Sim has its own ways of interacting with its side of power, so you just put its own card, the writer, up there, and it has some special cards it can get. And you also have the Speaker who can come here and take over the court. The Sim also has its own cards, its own Herald, and a number of companies, depending on the difficulty level you choose to play with. And the Sim's actions are fascinating because they're guided by these two different decks. So one is the Maneuver, so you draw this in the spring when it's the Simulacrum's turn. And it's going to tell you where it's going to put its Herald and where it's going to prioritize putting a Fog card if it has one in its hand. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Then in the summertime, when it is time to actually put cards out, you're going to draw a Resolution card. And the Resolution card is going to tell you which regions are a priority for the Sim. It's also going to give you some other information that in conjunction with the first card will help you determine what happens in each season for this turn for the Sim. The other thing is the Sim has synergies that are possible that can give it access to extra actions and extra power. So basically these cards both say regrouping. If we also end up with a fog card that says regrouping, although this one says plotting, you can also end up with cards that have special actions because they have synergy with the AI cards that are already out. The other thing that's very interesting about the Sim is that you, you essentially use the backs of the cards to determine their value to the Sim, and that's the order that you're going to place them in when they're bidding against you. So, for example, the Sim has a hand size of four. It'll have access to its air and three cards. 
And what makes this tough is that the Sim has two fog cards. It's got one with a gold back, which means this is something good. In this case, we know for sure it's the air. And it also has a silver card, which is half full and has a silver circle on the back. So this is going to help us determine the priority in which the Sim is going to put its cards out when it's bidding against us. And that means that we can see also the areas that the Sim thinks are particularly important. And we can play tactics against it that are kind of based on a little bit of information, but also not perfect information. And the reason we're not going to have perfect information uh, is that we have fog cards in this hand. So, for example, the gold will typically always be pretty good. Silver will be decent. That's pretty good. But the fog cards are interesting because they have really high values. They have suits. They have keywords. They have effects that can sometimes impact you. So freezing fog means that you have to discard the top card of your draw pile. And then if there is synergy between the fog card and the AI cards that are out. So for example, this one says regrouping and th these cards also are about regrouping. Then during autumn, this fog wall is going to get some extra boost to it that it wouldn't get otherwise. Whereas this freezing fog, which has warmongering on it, would not take effect if it was played with these AI cards. So essentially, the AI does some things that you can predict, and it's always going to be the first player, so you're going to get a chance to kind of see what it's doing, but it also has ways to surprise you, put you off guard, and really, really do some damage to you. The AI is also capable of taking cards off the king's road and stealing the ones that you've gotten, so you should be very careful. The other thing that's quite interesting about the AI is that you can play against either presets or against kind of an AI build of your own, and these have different heat levels, so you can choose how hard you want your experience against the AI to be. You probably want to start off pretty normal because honestly, this thing is hard. <laughs> but uh, when you're ready to level it up or you want some variety, there are a bunch of cards that are basically modifications for the AI. And basically the blue circle is kind of a nicer modification, whereas the red circles bring up the heat value. Uh, and so you want to be careful about the combinations of these that you're putting with your sim because they can make it extra nasty or they can make it a little bit sweeter to deal with, depending on the kind of game you want to have. So I could talk more, but because this game is technically still in development and there are little rules changes happening everywhere, I don't want to commit too much to the nitty gritty at this time. However, I do want to say this is a game that's nearly done. This is a game that already plays beautifully, so whatever changes that happen to it are going to be small. Uh, this game is very clever and mean. You know, trying to play against another person with these little trick-taking exercises is super tough. Uh, and honestly, the AI is both surprising and nasty. So I personally am really, really happy with where this game is at. I haven't even said anything about the beautiful art, although it's gorgeous. I, was, I feel like it probably speaks for itself. Pablo Clark is a fantastic artist. But what I wanted to showcase in this video, he's already showing so much talent as a game designer, and this is his first board game. This thing is phenomenal in terms of how it plays. I'm really, really excited about it, both for Game Night with a group and for Solo myself. Uh, Ricky's contributions are already really, really obvious. This is a very strong solo mode. And so I am very, very happy to see the Old King's Crown enter the scene as a game that I personally want to have and to play. I can't wait to see it in its final polished form, uh, because as it looks now, it's already really, really special and one of the better games I've seen this year. So that's what I have to say about the Old King's Crown. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment, and most of all, happy gaming.